resident doctor here. And uh, yeah, you were so saying... I was saying that Coffee Brown, who was our special guest last week, he came and joined us for a good discussion. He couldn't make this time, but he's going to be more of a regular. He should be here next week, and we're going to talk about ADHD and autism and amphetamines yes. and all sorts of good things. So he's going to join us for that, for that conversation. Which was a viewer suggestion from yeah. last week, so that should be pretty fun. Mm -hmm. um, I should go back and make sure I ping that person. We should. To make sure that they don't miss it. But so. today the topic is food. <clears throat> it's yes. going to be evolution in food, food or food evolution. Yes. And mm -hmm. we're going to bring in, uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions you guys have. And I'll bring in my own personal spin, which of course, if, if viewers have seen me before, you know that I'm kind of into the microbiome. Yep. So We're both kind of in the, into yeah. the microbiome. <laughs> so that provides a pretty good way to organize your thinking about food and what's good for us and about how we could have, may have co-evolved both with nutrition and with the microbes in our guts. So this should be a nice way to uh, introduce that topic. Yeah. And everybody loves food. That's true. I, I certainly do. Yeah. It comes up all the time in conversation. Oh, yeah. You know? <laughs> because you're always just waiting for the next time you get to eat. Right. That's how I live my life. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was, listen, I remember my going to my grandmother's farm in Virginia. Mm hmm and of course the whole experience revolved around food. Now they actually yeah. grew their own food, they had a big garden, but every single event was planning for the next big meal and the big event. So that, that's a very, very fond memory that I have. Yeah, I mean every family gathering usually revolves around some sort of food. Most that's holidays true. revolve around food. I mean, pretty much our entire lives revolve around food yeah. one way or another. And let's not, <laughs> let's not forget drink. That's true. Because you know, drink true. is an important yes. part of the whole experience. That's right. And there's a microbial story in, that we can talk about with oh, yeah. fermented foods, too. So we'll get into that. I think we should have a whole episode on fermented foods, honestly. Okay. I Honestly, that, that <laughs> one I've been holding on to for yeah. an episode of Science Happy Hour. Okay. Where we do the science of fermentation. It seems like so it's sort of a natural maybe one. Maybe we should have you on for I'm, that I'm a little one. surprised you haven't already. I, well, so it's part of the sustenance series, mm -hmm. which has an episode every once in a while. Speaking of which, the next one is this Friday, where we're doing Science of Wine 2.0. So it's just in the, the, it's in the pipeline. It okay. hasn't happened yet. So all things fermented. Yes. All yes, right, yes. sounds good. Yeah, we can make some kimchi and pickles and all kinds of Might stuff. Might as well have an on-air eating experience. Oh while yeah, we're at it, you we know? have done that before. We mm -hmm. did have a, a diet-related episode once before. Um, not necessarily microbiome-related, but yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, food, yay! <laughs> uh, <clears throat> best parties are when they move to the kitchen. It's true, it's true. That's People true. tend to congregate in the kitchen too. Have you guys noticed that at parties? No, it makes, makes sense. So if anybody's like building a house or designing a house or doing a remodel, Make sure you have enough space in the kitchen to you know accommodate that. Oh yeah, for sure. I have this crazy amount of like space in my home for entertaining, and yet everybody's always in the kitchen. So that yeah. was maybe a miscalculation on my part. This one's a, a this time of year is when everyone's eating Girl Scout cookies, including Anne, our buddy. So oh great. This is a a food item that's on everyone's mind these days. Mm -hmm. So yes, yes, they're shout, all gone. Shout now. out for Thin Mints. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I like tagalongs right. too. Okay. Those are. Also and just delicious. you know, pro tip: neither neither one of those are actually good for you. Nope. So we'll just we'll just leave that there. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. But they all. sure taste good, and they're darn addictive. Oh yeah, I yeah. I'm not sure I've ever been able to not eat a whole mm. uh, whole row of them. A little plastic sleeve of yeah, this yeah. the sleeve. They yeah, have yeah. a way of disappearing. <clears throat> they do that on purpose. They do. I feel like they know. They understand. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, food. Uh, shall we move over to our lovely slides? Well, we can. And before we kind of jump into the slides, yeah. you know, when people think about evolution in food, I think people tend to kind of do this little mind warp and think about what life was like in the Pleistocene. Oh, or, yes, the paleo or, diet. So, you know, I am actually wasn't prepared <clears throat> to talk about the paleo diet sure. per se, but mm -hmm. we can definitely talk about it. Yeah. But when people think about why is it that we like high sugar foods and lots of fat, you know, Talking about our that makes our, yeah our, makes uh, perfect evolutionary cookies. sense. Yeah. These were thought to be scarce in the environment, having energy dense foods were just not available, right. and so of course people tend to prioritize them when we like those foods. And the same same might go for salt. So th those yeah. are some those are some of the I would say conventional ideas that explain perhaps why it is that we like foods that aren't good for us. Right. And we have talked in the past about <clears throat> maybe microbes affecting our taste buds and 
um, affecting our taste preferences. Yes. That's another yes, possibility. Yes. But I think if we just think about what it is that foods, how they interact with our the microbes in our in our bodies, that that is a good way to think about whether a food is healthy or not. Yeah, we aren't just passively taking in food. We have other things in there that are also essentially taking in that food as well, one yeah. way or another. So. So yeah. So <laughs> you you never actually eat alone. So if you're no. having a meal and you're yeah feeling lonely, that's right. You, you actually have. I don't know, 30 trillion little buddies that <laughs> yeah. are living inside you. No and, big deal. And you're sharing your meal Just with them. It's my entourage. It's your entourage. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> the microbial entourage. That's right. <laughs> Trademark that. <It's> Scoop. <laughs> so, yeah, so we have to think about, well, what are the consequences of everything that we put into our mouths or don't put into our mouths? What is the impact of that on ourselves and, our, and our, on our microbes? Yeah. And what does that mean for our health and well-being as a human? Yeah. So I've gotten to the point where when I talk to colleagues, and there's lots of people, like you said, that are interested in food yeah. and in nutrition. And when they talk about things without bringing in the microbe part of the story, I get kind of nervous and antsy. And yeah. I'm like, how can, you know, you simply can't talk about food without this elephant in the room. It's not really an elephant. It's 30, 30 trillion microbes. Yeah. <laughs> and, the, and the impact that those have on our health. So when we talk about, say... Simple sugar or sugary carbonated drinks being bad for you? Well, they're bad for you in part because of what they do to your microbes. Yes. And how your microbes interact with you when you're eating a diet which is high in sugary right. sodas. So again, pro tip: let's avoid the sugary sodas. They're a bad idea. Yeah. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not 100% on the anti-carb idea. So okay. We can, we can kind of go into that that a little bit too. <clears throat> but certainly, eating, you know, processed cane sugar or sugary soft drinks. It's just a bad idea. It's just not something that, especially super, super pro processed sugars. Um, right. we're, it's just not something that we are really evolved to be processing through our bodies. Yeah. It's extra available, if you will. Exactly. <clears throat> um, well, I will. In the previous episode that we had um, on diet, we, uh, we looked at Gary Taub's book. Hmm. Um, uh, I'm forgetting what it's called. It's about sugar. Yeah, it's about sugar. Uh, the case against sugar. The case against sugar. Yeah, sorry, I forgot the name. So um, does Gary Taub <clears throat> talk about the microbiome? Uh, a little bit, yeah. Okay. He does, yeah. But most most of it is, um, he starts to go into some of the early science, looking at what sugar, like how physiologically sugar is processed in the body and what it's doing over time yeah. um, <clears throat> to things like the liver pancreas, et cetera. So if I understand, I've, I've read some of his work. Mm -hmm. A lot of what he talks about doesn't involve the microbiome. It's talking about right. how sugar actually interacts with your body. Yes. So one thing that, that I think is probably true, and it <clears throat> might, might not be impossible to do this experiment, but it would be for us humans, is that if we evolved without a microbiome, there's no reason why sugar would be bad for us. Mm. So, so I'm saying that the reason why junk food is bad for us is because we have evolved along with these microbes that compete with us for food. Ah, uh, okay. And so the outcome of that co-evolution of ourselves and our microbiome has made it so that simple, a, a, a high sugar diet for us is very, very bad. I mean, not bad be bad for a hummingbird, but it's definitely bad for us. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. It's not like there's some even mammal universal saying that sugar is bad dietarily. Yeah. Um, and this is what's so powerful about the, these germ-free studies, where they make they raise animals without a microbiome, right. and then they can feed, they can more or less feed them whatever. They can feed them pure junk food, high fat, high sugar diet, and they don't get fat, they don't get diabetes, they don't die early. They're able to tolerate these supposedly unhealthy foods in the absence of a microbiome. And that's not to say that sugar sugar does interact with your body. Yeah, it interacts with you know, your pancreas and produces insulin gets taken up as glycogen and goes into your liver. All right. those things happen. But even for us, if there was a way to make us germ-free, and you kind of can with antibiotics, um, temporarily, sure. yeah, yeah. <laughs> like to do an experiment, we could tolerate junk foods. It's just that's not a recipe for long-term hmm. health. Interesting. All right? So most of what Gary Taub says mm -hmm. is um, <clears throat> talks about that just physiological process. And right. with the sheer amount of sugar that we are getting, uh, on a daily basis that 
that process is not really built to deal with that amount of sugar, and then that those chronically high levels of sugar, just the processing alone, can have effects. I mean, they're essentially promoting insulin resistance, and it's just the I I. I I'm wondering if, if he's maybe missing the microbiome piece of that, or I'm wondering if there is one. I think his attention is focused in on something else. Okay. And I, you know, I like to bring people, draw people back into the microbiome. I think it's so important. And like I said, it's true. <clears throat> you can take an experimental mouse, you can make them germ-free, you can feed them essentially, as long as you're not giving them arsenic, you right. can feed them any combination of sugar and fat and, and, and salt, and they don't get sick. So would that so in the absence of a microbiome, say in a human, the mm -hmm. same process that um, that he is saying promotes things like insulin resistance and then diabetes thereafter, mm -hmm. would that not occur in the absence of a microbiome? So in us, yeah. well, like I said, we haven't done that experiment. Right, we don't know the answer, but theoretically, yeah. theoretically, I would say that if if there was a way to make humans <clears throat> have not have a microbiome. And make it make it so we could breed people without a microbiome. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm not, I'm not right, advocating right. for this. Yeah, yeah. But you do the <laughs> this is not really a sooner thing or later we would be able to tolerate junk food with no problem. Interesting. But this is what I think. And like I said, it's hard to propose an experiment that you can't actually yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. That's sort of anti-scientific. Sure. Because uh, I believe it was Karl Popper that said that to be scientific, you have to be able to falsify your argument. Right. But you could do an experiment with a you know an animal, and you could breed them for some hmm. period of, of years and see what happens. Interesting. But yeah, so I am very microbiome centric. I think that junk food is junk food because of the microbiome. I really think this is true. I think that okay. healthy food is healthy food because, because of, the, of microbiome. the microbiome. And we can harness the microbiome and actually make our lives healthier and better. Interesting. And it can, it should, it, that, that concept <clears throat> should inform your food choices. Okay. If it's true. Well, speaking of food choices, well, right. actually, before we get to that point, um, right. can a human even survive without a microbiome? That's a really good question. So I remember I went to a conference on the microbiome in 2012, okay. and I asked people that because everybody likes to focus on the good part of the microbiome, mm -hmm. and the microbiome does do good things for us. Right. It can protect us from infection. That's the main thing it does, and it can produce vitamins that are useful to us. Um, but you might think that maybe uh, maybe we have to have a microbiome. I will tell you that people in the intensive care unit. Um, after they've been had their microbiomes obliterated by antibiotics, right. they don't tend to do very well. Yeah. But that's usually because they're then susceptible to getting an infection. Yep. But if you could have someone truly in a sterile environment, hmm. I would predict that humans could survive without a microbiome. Mice can. Okay, right. Um, birds, uh, birds are able to do it. Okay. So like chicks, that chickens can be raised germ-free. Uh, and, and various insects can. Now there are some species of animals that can't. And I think that they're mostly invertebrates that, that have been shown to not be able to survive or reproduce mm. without a microbiome. Okay. But as far as I know, every mammal that's been looked at has been able to, to survive without a microbiome. And in mm. fact, um, there are some examples of animals living longer. Mice live longer without a microbiome. Interesting. Rats live longer without a microbiome. Pigs live longer without a microbiome. Wow, that's crazy. Chicks. Chickens can live longer without a microbiome. So for us, it's more about not having the ability yeah. to be in a truly sterile environment that yeah. prevents us from doing that. Like I said, if you're a termite and your life involves chewing on wood or cellulose and you have <laughs> to have that breakdown of the cellulose by a, mi by a microbe, mm -hmm. then yeah, you'd have a tough time surviving without a microbiome. And the same goes if you're a strict you know, plant eater, a leaf eater, or if you're, if you're a cow and you have a rumen that you need to have microbes that digest the food for you. But we don't. Actually, part of being human is the fact that we don't rely on our microbiome to digest food. That's true. That makes us unlike, yeah. say, a, a lowland gorilla or a howler monkey that eat mostly plants. Right. The part of our guts that are dependent on fermentation for, for survival, just are, they're very small, much smaller. We've evolved to not need <clears throat> that for, to, to survive. So could the microbiome be considered a vestigial cohabitation? Do we think it's... Well, what does vestigial mean? So, meaning that it's not yeah. necessary and it's mm. a byproduct of something? <clears throat> I think it's more complicated than that. Maybe not byproduct. Just because but. we've always had a microbiome. Yeah, I don't know that sort. we... Yeah, it's not like... And we can't quite get rid of it. We had a microbiome, we're using it, and yeah. then now all of a sudden we aren't using it. That's like the, I guess, the traditional colloquial meaning of vestigial. Right. So I think of vestigial in terms of evolution as describing things like wisdom teeth. 
Right. But people say, yep. well, maybe we needed them back they in the day. They lost their function. And... I had mine carved out of my face right. by, <clears throat> by a, um, a maxillofacial surgeon mm -hmm. when I was like 15 years old. It was a horrible experience. Ouch. But the argument was, yeah, you don't need these and they're going to do you harm. Yeah, yeah. And you can make the same argument about, about the appendix. That's vestigial. That maybe it serves some function back when we were plant eaters, mm -hmm. but it doesn't anymore. Haven't I seen some things recently uh, showing mm -hmm. that we know a little bit more about its current function and it's not at least zero? Well, that's what I think. There is. There have been two or three papers that describe the appendix as being a safe house for mm. beneficial bugs in your micro. Oh, in your interesting. Microbiome. So again, I'm not making the argument, but that the microbiome is all bad. Right. I think that. The point that I like to make about the microbiome is it's both good and bad. And that's, that's really the key. So if, as far as the, as the appendix goes, your gut and your microbes in your abdomen can cause a terrible infection. <clears throat> and all, probably all of us have experienced diarrhea. So we get this rapid motility. Everything gets flushed out. So you can imagine that if there were some good microbes, they might be housed in the appendix. And that could allow you to repopulate your your. Uh, your guts after you get sick. Interesting. So that's one mm. idea. This is not my research. I don't even know if it's true, but I think it's a plausible and kind Seems of interesting plausible. idea. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I'll have to look into that more. That's interesting. Uh, going mm -hmm. back to the sugar real quick. Sugar. Do you have any personal recommendations for how much sugar someone should actually be eating? Do you All know right. much about this? Well, we'll get into why, you know, certain foods, why we should consider <clears> them good or bad. And... So I'd say processed, simple sugar in general is bad, and you should try to minimize it. We definitely get flooded with excess sugar in our it's modern everywhere. diet. It's everywhere. That's just, the, the yeah. I think that's the most dangerous thing about it is that it's it's mm -hmm. hidden sources. It's in everything. Yeah. And it's yeah. A lot so of people I, don't I mean, think about it that when way. When you really think about it, I think that Tobbs makes this argument mm -hmm. that when you go in the supermarket and you just kind of look around, you can kind of have the idea that man, everything in here is trying to poison me. It's got all this added sugar. They've taken out. Processed food basically right. means you've added very easy to digest things like sugars and fats and yep. salt, and they've Make taken the fiber good. out. Yeah. So like a, a food that's not been processed typically has lower amount of sugar mm -hmm. and more fiber. Unfortunately, as far as the microbiome goes, they've taken out the good stuff and they've added yeah, some of the bad stuff. Yeah, you need that fiber. So that's true. And so the, when I say that the modern, say, North <clears throat> American diet is bad for us, well, we know that from looking at uh, Tohono O'odham Native Americans. Mm, okay. So you know the Tell story? Tell me more. No, I the, don't. The Pima Indians? Oh, the Pima. Okay, Pima, sure. Pima Paradox. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. Oh, yes. So I, just I as an I'm accident of history, the Pima Indians, otherwise known as Tohono O'odham, they live in southern Arizona, and the border goes between U.S. and Mexico goes right through right. their nation. So there are Mexican Pima, or Tohono O'odham, and there are Arizonan, the group. Yep. So back in the 60s and 70s, people realized that obesity and diabetes was very common in the Arizona side, but not so much on the Mexico side. And the Native Americans living in Mexico, again, these are genetically the same people, right. separated by an international border. Um, but the ones that ate a traditional diet, mostly of corn and beans, kind of subsistence <clears throat> agriculture, they, had, they were lean and had essentially no diabetes. Yep. The Tohono O'odham who adopted the traditional, you know, eating spam and sugary foods and yep. McDonald's on the weekends, mm -hmm. well, they became overweight. Up to 90% of them actually have diabetes. So it's a huge, huge proportion That's of crazy. the population. So when you think about diet, so the only thing different here is the food and maybe right. a little bit about physical activity. Sure. So that tells us that something about our diet is quite bad for that group in particular. Maybe people that aren't of that ethnic background are a little more protected. It's also um, similar to the Hispanic health paradox as exactly. well. Exactly. Um, yeah. Which is, it's a very similar thing. It's not What's this, that? you know, uh, sort of arbitrary s separation. It's mm -hmm. more that people who migrate here uh, and have been here for only a short amount of time are typically healthier uh, than their longer living in America counterparts. And I think healthier than everybody. Yeah, actually. So the general yes. population. So Hispanics living, say, in southern New Mexico. <laughs> Arizona, right, or northern New Mexico for that matter, mm -hmm. um, that there are certain groups of, of folks that eat a more traditional diet that tend to do better. So, so the lesson I think is that if you eat the diet that you've spent a little bit of your evolutionary time eating, right, 
okay, maybe not ten or a hundred thousand years ago. Sure, yeah. We don't yeah. have to go totally Stone Age paleo. Yeah. But the diet, certainly the, the Tohono O'odham ate, which actually had a lot of carbs in it. They weren't mm -hmm. eating just mastodon. Right. And, Tons of corn. You know, bison. Yeah. They had lots of corn, lots of beans. Yep. And they they do well as from a health perspective. That's that's their that's the ideal diet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it, so it's it's the the processedness that I think is yeah. the key there. Um, so unfortunately, so pros, pr preferring processed foods also seems to be a, a human trait. Mm. You know, mm, interesting. And if you think about it, we're the only species that cooks. So yes. cooking is kind of food that processing. Is, yeah, it is right? certainly, or even just mushing something up. Yeah. Also, Sma we, smashing we things. That, yes. Basically, food processing is part of being human. We've just taken it over the cliff as far as I'm concerned. Sure. Mm -hmm. So this is a uniquely human thing that we do. We process foods. We make it more, quote, unquote, nutritious. We concentrate the calories. We take out some of the fiber, although not all, traditionally. And that, that's what humans have done for the last mm -hmm. 100,000 years. Fiber is really good for you. And I, I've heard a lot recently about if you have sugar that is, like, say, a piece of fruit, for example. Mm -hmm. There's obviously sugars inside of that piece of fruit, but it's also coupled with some amount of, of fiber, and that that's generally a better source of sugar, quote unquote, uh, yeah. than drinking a soda or something like that. And part of the reason why it could be better mm -hmm. for you is because of the presence of that fiber. Um, well, that's right. I have heard um, 50 grams. I th is it 50 grams? Yeah, it is grams. That seems an, like an unbelievable amount. But of fiber? Of, of sugar is kind of like you're supposed to have like less than 50 a day, um, which is surprisingly yeah. hard. Well, the other lesson, and again, I'm not a diet guru or anything. Right, and that's just something I've heard. I'm not putting my stamp People who try to very strictly restrict how much they eat or, rest or try to count calories and look at, say, a low limit of the number of carbs that they eat, that's, I think, a recipe for disaster, and people just can't do it long term. Yeah, you know, it works maybe short term. In fact, any diet really seems to work in terms of weight loss short term. But these things are not going to make you healthy in the long term. In fact, right. people will they fail to do it. Yeah, so, it's more about finding what works for you and mm -hmm. and something that would you would actually be able to sustain, um, maybe slightly on the healthier side of the spectrum. Hopefully, yeah. Uh, and slightly less sugar. <laughs> um, but getting back but to yeah. that, that food processing thing. Yes. Um, hey, Uncle so humans Bill, what's up? have tended to, like I said, concentrate energy in, in what they eat and take fiber out. So I think the advent of fire. So Richard Wrangham says that's about maybe maybe close to a hundred thousand years ago, yeah. almost when humans first appeared. Mm -hmm. There's some evidence of charcoal in some of these ancient human sites. So cooking, if you think about it, is actually food processing. It's oh yeah, heating up. Breaking down some of those the fibers um, actually makes a lot of the, the nutrients more bioavailable to yes. us. So it might be something that um, has permitted us to evolve big brains. Uh, have, certainly has evolved a different digestive tract from our close ape relatives mm -hmm. like chimpanzees and gorillas. Uh, so that's that's food processing. Yeah. And then if you think about what agriculture is, agriculture has required a certain amount of food processing to take care of the grains that we grow. Um, and that's also been a, a massive kind of advance, if you think about it, uh, for what, again, what makes us a modern human. But Absolutely. outsourcing all of our food production to Nestle or to General Mills or to M&M Mars mm -hmm. is going to be a mistake. Yeah. Because they've taken that to the extreme extreme. And people might, might still hey, pref cool have preferences for these foods, but it's going to make us, make us sick. Yeah. It's kind of like the, you know, it's everything's a pendulum swing. This right. is just the the farthest pendulum swing going more towards we're, we're mushing things up, we're cooking, and right. then we've gone, you know, 100,000 years doing that, and now we're just extra, extra, extra processing in a way that's not healthy. Yeah. So, so. if I said that junk food is bad, of us, bad for us because of the microbiome, I mean, fiber is good for us because of the microbiome. Right, absolutely. If you feed it a germ-free animal fiber, it's going to do absolutely nothing for them. Really? It's going to go out the other end without any, you know, I mean, technically, so you can't of, digest it, and that's part of the reason why we need it. Yeah. Um, because they need it. Well, you get some bang for your buck. Yeah. If you eat, if you eat dietary fiber, so you don't have the means to actually break down those right. complex carbohydrates and take the energy out of them, but the microbes do. And the yes. microbes will then ferment these things 
and you can extract about 10%, well, for us, about 10% of our dietary energy comes out of fermentation. All right, so there's, wow. there's our fermentation again. There you you go. need the microbes to, to get that bang for your buck or that amount of energy that you get out of yeah. it. Yeah, and they're very happy eating it. They're happy too. So, yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, all right. Well, let's, let's, let's move on to our, our slides then and maybe get off our soapbox a little bit. <laughs> okay. Or perhaps stay on it. I don't know. I mean, we're not really truly soapboxing. You know. I'm giving it a good go. Yeah, you know. Mm -hmm. Usually, I, I associate <laughs> soapboxing with a more spirited argument. We're, we're having a, a nice, quiet, civil conversation, so it's not, not quite soapboxing. All right. <laughs> um, all right. So, what do we have today? An eel. So, that's, that is a mora eel, and that's a cleaner shrimp. Mm -hmm. So, audience... What do we call people on Twitch? Um, community members. Community members. I've heard people. I've heard people say Twitchers, and then I've also yeah. heard people say, "If you say Twitcher, then you know nothing about Twitch." So we'll call we'll call community members. Yeah. Have you guys gone Viewers. scuba diving? Have you been to? Uh, I've seen these guys in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Chat. Yes, you can call us chat. That All makes right. sense. Chat. Yes. Have you seen seen these guys scuba diving? Because I have, and it's pretty awesome. All right, the mora eel has a bunch of little sharp teeth. And here's the cleaner shrimp, which is actually in its mouth. And mm -hmm. this is actually an example of, of a mutualism. Yeah. The, I love these the examples. The cleaner shrimp actually eats little bits of food in the more eel's mouth. The eel, in return, does not kill the shrimp, amazingly, because you'd, you'd think that it would. Right. <laughs> it's just right there. All it has to do is shut its mouth. <laughs> but they actually have learned they go to these cleaner stations, and the fish kind of line up, and they all get cleaned by the, by the shrimp. It's amazing. There's so here's... Here's an example of cooperation between two unrelated yeah. species around nutrition and food. So cooperation does happen. So I bring this up because the same thing does happen in our guts too. Yes. There is an yeah, opportunity sure. for some cooperative arrangements between ourselves and our and our gut microbes. This happens a lot in sharks too. Mm -hmm. Certain small fishes will right. hang out on top of sharks and clean off their mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah, so they're a cleaner fish too. Mm -hmm. And so if you haven't seen this, put on some snorkel gear. Go to, I saw the last place I saw this was actually in Kauai in uh, in Hawaii. Oh, cool! Um, where I saw something along these lines. Nice. A, a I don't think station. I've ever seen it in real life. No. It was really Somewhere. amazing. So the fish, all fish that go to these cleaner stations, will also kind of signal to. In the case yeah, of the Kauai, they were um, sure. they were cleaner fish, and the fish kind of they lie on their side and they'll kind of flex their pectoral fins mm -hmm. and they give these crazy displays. And that's that's bringing the cleaner fish in. That will kind of clean clean things off of them, um, and again, the predatory fish don't eat the cleaner fish, so it's really yeah. a, a nice example of cooperation. Yeah, this is kind of all over the place. Um, yeah. Birds and alligators. I think I've heard something about that before too. Hey, what's up, inner life? Um, yeah, it's all over the place. Interesting, and also inside of us. So. No, I'm Patrick. Yes, we're all Patrick. We're all Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> I think they were. I think they were. Um, Simulating the conversation between the two. I yeah, think. I think. I like correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, <clears throat> so if that's cooperation over food. Here's an example of conflict. Yep. We got a. I think it's a new or it's a wildebeest. Yes. And it's being attacked by both lions and hyenas. Mm -hmm. And I forget which which group actually made the kill, but clearly the lion would like to monopolize those I think resources. Hyenas are. So Mostly scavengers. I think you're right. So, so I'd probably put my money on the, lion. the lion killed the wildebeest, yeah. and now they're fighting over it. So here, here you have a valuable resource, a bit of a package of energy oh, yeah. that was in that wildebeest, and that can go to making more lions, <coughs> or it can go to making more hyenas. And in this case, you got the two or unre keeping unrelated the existing groups, ones healthy, or keeping them healthy, so they can live another day. Yes. And if you're a predator, this is kind of what what it's all about. So just because cooperation exists in the animal animal world does not mean that it's all cooperative. So when you right. hear something about, oh yeah, we have to take care of your friendly little microbes mm -hmm. because all they're doing is good things for you, it's not totally true. They, they have the opportunity sometimes to kind of divert resources from you and they can, they can actually make you sick in important ways. So I think that a lot of the microbiome science loses track of this. When we think about nutrition, in fact, I heard a talk today on, it was a TEDx talk Ooh. by somebody that I like and I was listening to talk thinking, oh, that's kind of not true. And oh, that's the speaker fun. was going on and on about how you need the microbes to again give you all this extra food, nutrition, and it's so wonderful. 
But no, they can. your relationship with your microbes can kind of be like the, what we see here with the hyenas <coughs> and the lions. There can be a fight over food. It's a delicate balancing act. I, I, I think that's probably the take-home message from every discussion we've had previously about microbiome, that it can be both good and bad, and ultimately what's going on inside of us all the time is we are keeping them at bay, and mm -hmm. they are helping us out in the process. So you can just stop watching now. Yeah. That's the take-home point. There you go. It's a balance. The end. Good, bad, <laughs> and uh, no. It's <laughs> true of most things, right? I mean. But yeah. But I, I think because mm -hmm. microbiome is such a hot ticket right now, um, it seems like most of what is talked about in terms of the microbiome is this beneficial side of yeah. it. It's this glowing entity inside of us that makes us awesome. So I think there are some, in the scientific community, there are some true believers who yeah. think the microbiome evolved just to do good things for us. Mm -hmm. That's not what I believe. Yeah, that just feels very um, feels one-sided right. yeah. to me. And even some people who I think should know better Still kind of in slip into this idea of this cooperative, purely yeah. beneficial, microbial community. But I can give you plenty of examples where, where that cooperation breaks down, just like what we're seeing here with the hyenas and the there lions. There you go, yeah. So for you and the foods you eat, what mm. you want to do is you want to cultivate cooperation. You want to avoid conflict. We'll be conflict avoiding here. Or if you are going to <laughs> conflict with your microbes, you want to win that conflict. Sure. And so you can do that with food choices. There you go. Um, so what... What kinds, I mean, maybe we're going to get into this, but uh, what kinds of conflict might we see with our own microbiomes in terms of food? Well, so we will get into this. Okay. And I we think if you just look at the way your gut is arranged, mm -hmm. that fermentation I was talking about, right. so like getting energy out of food, well, that happens in your colon, all right? So that's the very, very end of your digestive tract. Mm -hmm. So that's where most of the microbes live. And in mm -hmm. fact, you as a human, you tolerate the existence of about one and a half kilograms of, or two kilograms of microbes, mostly in your in lower intestine. You don't tolerate that overabundance of microbes in your small intestine, right? Or in your stomach or esophagus, because mm -hmm. that, yeah, would, that, that would, would not be kill good. you. Mm -hmm. All right, your bowel isn't isn't the, the bowel wall isn't thick enough; it can't contain the microbes. So if they exist at high densities there, they spread into your bloodstream. Next thing you know, you're in the hospital. I'm taking care of you. It's not a good idea. You don't want to be there. Yeah. All and right. that's, that alone seems to be an argument that I couldn't ignore if I were trying to think that everything is beneficial about it. Well, exactly. You so know? the microbes it are not, are not there. It only exists in this one particular place because that's the only place we can kind of keep them at bay. Exactly. Thank you for that, Kate. You're welcome. It's a very good way of putting it. Yeah. I mean, that just yeah. seems like a really important point if you're trying to argue that it's all hunky-dory. Yeah. So cooperation or conflict is dependent on your body's geography. Yeah. Your internal geography. So you get conflict in certain places, cooperation in others, and gotcha. yeah, a big part of your physiology is keeping the microbes kind of where they belong. Yeah, yeah. And if they escape and they're just doing their little microbial thing, they can they can make you quite sick. So that's, that's no one good. example. That's no good. Yeah, so let's we'll we'll continue. I, I guess with while that. we're on that topic, because this is kind of a fun one. Yeah. Um, thinking about well, where does the conflict happen? One area of conflict has to do with in, in kids that are malnourished. So I'm thinking mm -hmm. of there's an image of a Malawian kid. I don't <clears> think I have his picture in this, in this slideshow. But with the kind of the distended belly, the mm. emaciated quash your limbs, core. with kwashiorkor. Kwashiorkor is a condition in which you have a dysbiosis. So you have this unhealthy community of microbes in your guts. Right. And you have a community of microbes that's kind of looking out for itself. It is excessively diverting resources for the microbiota and not letting that growing child get access to the energy. So here, you, it's almost like a parasite. You have this parasite yeah. which is, is bad. And so for these kids with kwashiorkor, core, you, almost, you have to treat them with antibiotics and kill off those microbes because those are conflict microbes. And part of this is diet related too. Yeah. It has to do with not enough protein in the diet and they're eating, um, they're actually eating, that group is eating too, much, too many carbohydrates um, and they, act, they can get sick because of it. Because they get, well think of it as a greedy or a selfish microbiota that are taking up too much of the energy right. for the microbe itself. That's yes. how I see it. That viewpoint is consistent with the evidence. Okay. And that's that's what I think. Because as of my very limited knowledge of it, it's a mm -hmm. it's a just general malnourishment that if you're not getting enough energy, ultimately this will happen over a period of time. Well, again, if you or could do the experiment and you if you could make a child 
germ free, <clears throat> right? <laughs> then you could probably feed a kid a protein deficient diet, and they wouldn't get kwashiorkor. In other words, kwashiorkor is at least in part a disease of the microbiome. Okay. All right. And gotcha. In that case, it's not doing good things for you. No, certainly it's not. It's diverting energy. It's actually right. worsening and making the malnourishment actually even worse. So I think about this as microbes can eat your lunch. They can actually take. They can be excessively selfish. Sure. Yeah. And take up too much of, of your food. So that's one way the conflict can happen. Okay. Uh, hey, Kimash, what's up? Um, I, I took that image off there for you. I, I realized as soon as you came in, you might not want to see that. So oh. um, let's move yeah, on. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I get rid of the the animals. Uh, other than that, I think that that should be the only you know potentially. There's no more upsetting thing. Yeah. Upsetting stuff. Yeah, yeah. Unless you think about microbiota as being upsetting. I mean, maybe. Who knows? All right. Who knows? So let's, 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 <laughs> let's, let's move back to a vegetarian diet. Yes. Resource sharing, cooperation. This is more like the cleaner shrimp example. Mm -hmm. So here, you, you, when you eat fiber, this is kind of a, a picture of what happens. You can't actually digest the fiber or get any right. benefit out of it unless you have a microbiota that is doing the fermentation. They produce these little energy bundles. They're mm. called short-chain fatty acids. Lovely. And those can be readily taken up by your little cells in your intestines and then go into your bloodstream, feed your brain, and do very good things. Yep. So in fact, this is an example of cooperation. So this, the simple take home point is, if you eat fiber, you are promoting this resource sharing, and this is in general a arrangement that you might have with your microbes that is overall healthy. So then you might think, well, why aren't we just vegetarians and just doing this, you know, this cooperative sure. thing? And I think the answer is that sometimes we're better off <laughs> being a little bit selfish and, and taking up some resources without the benefit of, right. of the microbiota. Mm -hmm. So I think that we are definitely evolved to eat a little bit more than just leaves. Gotcha. Um, this is a, from a paper you are in. This is a paper like. with a couple of colleagues. Cool. Helen Washalewski, Athena Actippus, myself. Nice. Published this paper. It's called Cooperation and Conflict in the Microbiome. Look at that. <laughs> published How in relevant. 2016. So yeah, thank you for giving props to my colleagues. <laughs> they, they had a lot to do with it. I yeah, of course. I did not come up with this image. They did, they did a nice job. It's a that. very nice image. I really enjoy it, yeah. actually. The energy bundles are yeah. quite uh, quite nice. Um, okay. So next up, I think we have milk. Milk. Yes. Breast so milk. Before I actually had a picture of a, a, a Chimani Bolivian woman breastfeeding, mm. but it wasn't my photograph. And yeah. I, didn't, I didn't ask the person permission if I could use sure. it. Sure. So now I just have a picture of milk in there a bottle. Go. That's probably better. Yeah. I don't I don't think we could really no, I don't know. For educational purposes we might be able to get away with it, but can't put a, a I would feel a little weird put a about on putting the, uh, on putting a boob on Twitch. All right, so we, we didn't do that. <laughs> uh, I'm sure it'll be okay. And part of you know, part of public health around breastfeeding is removing the stigma around breastfeeding and actually encouraging people to do it in public. Um, because that's something which seems to be important for baby's health in general. So there was a paper that came out recently. Is it Rebecca Sears? That sounds yeah. very familiar. Anthropologist. Yes. yes. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. She wrote something about this on the Twitters, <laughs> talking about how um, it's thought that some 600,000 children died because of uh, promoting formula feeding as opposed to breastfeeding. Um, ah, yes. This is Nestle, mostly in Africa, but also in other places in, in, the, in the third world. But hey, the point about breast milk is not only is it just good, but breast milk contains food that babies can't digest, cannot digest. Mm, okay. So and if you look also at antibodies and things. All, yeah, all kinds of good stuff. I don't know why stuff. I motioned at my boobs when I did that. No, I thought that was <laughs> just a general, a general <laughs> hand motion. Please ignore. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you have breast milk, like all food, has, well, not all food, but has fat. It's got carbohydrate. It also has a kind of a fiber, an indigestible fiber. These are called human milk oligosaccharides. And these HMOs are the second most abundant kind of carbohydrate in breast milk. Mm. Babies can't digest HMOs. If you had a baby, just a baby, there's no digestion. So this is energetically expensive for mom to make this. Why would mom make this component of breast milk that doesn't do anything for the baby right. by itself? Good the answer, question. What's the answer? You know the answer. Microbiome? There you go. Yes. <laughs> Micro, so these are, it's basically fertilizer from microbiome. And it's a very special kind of fertilizer because the HMOs, they preferentially feed a specific strain 
of bifidobacteria, a special kind that, that actually promotes baby's health. Wow. And um, human babies, their, their stool is dominated by this bifidobacterium strain. And if you have this, you're less likely to get diarrhea. You are more likely to, in most cultures, grow up to, uh, through childhood and become an adult and reproduce. So in other words, this is an example of resource sharing that happens between two different kinds of organisms, a human and a microbe, and also happens between two different generations. So it's intergenerational resource sharing. It's really cool when you think about it. That is very cool. So breastfeeding is super important. It is. It's, that's why it makes me sad now that I know that I was not breastfed, because it explains so much. I know. <laughs> I'm also a bundle of allergies. I think we talked about this. Yeah, yeah, we have. I was yeah. given some kind of crazy Similac, you know, soy milk. Mm -hmm. This is like, and I was, listen, yeah, I, was I, had a, soy. I was a baby some time ago, all right? <laughs> um, so yeah, it was actually in the yeah late 60s, early 70s, and I was, like I said, an allergic disaster. Yep. And I still am sometimes. I know. It's been so bad right now with everything <laughs> blooming. My right. asthma is just like, ugh, it's right. pretty bad. So that's another story in which having the right food early in life trains your immune system to, to do beneficial things for us. Yes. So. And a lot of that yeah. goes through the microbiome. Yeah. Very important. So you might say, well, gosh, here you've been talking about how the microbiome is both good and bad. That's clearly an example of how the microbiome is good, right? And I would say, yes, the microbiome is good, but it takes this push from the immune system and it takes mm. this energetic investment from mom. If you don't have that push or that, that investment and the IgA and the immunoglobulins that you talked about, that's a big part of it. Mom spends a lot of her energy adjusting baby's microbiome and making it as healthy as possible. The microbes are not going to do this on their own. They will only do it if they're forced to be that way right. from you. Yeah, that's how we keep them at bay. Yeah, yes. <laughs> exactly. Um, <clears throat> Are we, so we have a question from Kimosh. I believe this is true, yes, mm -hmm. um, but I may ask for some clarification. Mm -hmm. Are we the only species that drinks infant milk beyond infancy? I'm guessing, do you mean milk in general, or do you mean like human breast milk? Um, or are you talking about other forms of milk? Because um, if you are talking mm -hmm. about other forms of milk, I believe, yes, we are the only one that actually drinks milk beyond so That's a good question. Our, I, I wonder yes. what species has the longest duration yeah. of lactation. I know somebody would know the answer. I'm sure, yeah. I, I, I would imagine that it, it scales with how long they are in the infant period or right. like their general life history tra trajectory. I'm guessing maybe a killer whale okay. or something yes. like that. I have no idea. Yeah, it could be. Or maybe it's us humans. We have this very, yeah. very long we do, yeah, of, right. Of development. There's a lot of variation in how long people yeah. typically breastfeed or how long they can, yeah. even. Um, but yes, we are the only other species that actually drinks milk beyond infancy. So just and, to, uh, yeah. yeah, and it's a. I think you were bringing it up earlier that it's cow's milk is not something that many populations of humans are actually evolved to process. Um, we have lactase persistence, which was the, the thing that evolved. It wasn't the, the ancestral uh, character. Mm -hmm. So in particular, spe uh, not species, sorry, uh, populations, you have lactase persistence and some individuals in other populations, obviously, but uh, there are many populations who just don't have lactase persistence. So, you, so why, is cannot, it, why is it wrong to say lactose intolerance? Why is it wrong to say lactose intolerance? Yeah. Um, well, you're saying you're saying lactose persistence. Lactase persistence. Lactase persistence. Yeah. So it's. I mean, they they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. So. But, but one, you get you lactose of, intolerance if you lack lactase persistence. Oh, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. That's essentially. Well, this what also it is, has so. to do has to do with how we use language to kind of medicalize things that are really normal. Yeah. For the value, if you take a human at random oh, off the I planet, I see what you're saying. Okay. Most people don't have lactase persistence. Yes. And so they are therefore lactose intolerant. But they are normal. That yeah, is the normal that is human the normal condition. Human condition. Yeah. So, but there's only a subset of humans right. that have actually spent at least the last 6,000 years mm -hmm. raising up dairy animals for, yes. for milk. Yep. And so those groups of humans have been selected for this gene of lactase persistence. Yep. So that's so it's actually pretty unique and pretty new, even for us mam humans, not to mention mammals overall, to drink milk throughout the, our lifespan. Did you have dairy today? I, I'm allergic, so no. 
Yeah, I, I am, so. I'm a step beyond lactose intolerance. All right. It'll kill me. I love the lactose. I love, uh, love all things dairy. Yep. I love milk. <laughs> like we, have, we have like three different kinds of milk in my refrigerator right now. It's all whole milk, by the way. Yeah. We have yogurt that we've made ourselves. Nice. And it's like loaded with probiotics. Good stuff. So anyway, I am not lactose. Toast intolerant. So you have lactase persistence. I, lac I have lactase persistence. Again, there you go. Guys, it makes me weird. Um, that is, yeah. It's, but I happen a... to love it. I love cheese. I love, I love all that dairy. So for anybody who's going to like argue that um, we humans shouldn't be eating it, that's probably true for certain humans. Yeah. I don't think it's true for me. Yeah, I mean, you do you, right? <laughs> That's um, right. Isn't it true that that many people are who are lactose intolerant just have very low levels of symptoms, or? Maybe they don't realize it, or maybe they are just in a so, culture that doesn't eat it that much. Or... I think that it really depends on the composition of your microbiota. Okay. And in fact, I do remember reading something that says that your lactase gene can be turned on or off, ah. kind of by signals that come from the microbiota. So in other words, here's one example of like, it's not just that you have the gene, and so therefore it's always on, mm -hmm. and so therefore you can eat any dairy product throughout your life. You might exhibit a little bit plus or minus lactose intolerance, depending on whether you've had antibiotics or kind of the composition of the microbes in your guts, that that actually has an impact on your symptoms. So again, you highlighting, you can't talk about diet without talking about the microbiome. I'm yes. sorry, you just can't do it. Yep. I mean, I, you can do it. I remember when I was a kid mm -hmm. and they just thought I was lactose intolerant. Yeah. Um, this was before I, I knew I was allergic to dairy. Right. Um, they told me, oh, have you tried eating yogurt? Because there's... Mm. Um, there are cultures inside of the yogurt and therefore they may actually help you digest the lactose that's in there um, and I, at the time I was like well no that doesn't really work for mm. me either <laughs> so you know yeah so the it was a thinking process. chat is yes. that <laughs> the thinking is that the microbiome actually break down the lactose so they kind of do the job right. for you and they make it into lactic acid yep so if you think about lac lactation the root comes from milk. Yeah. And so lactobacilli that are milk associated bacteria, yep. they break down the lactose and they make it into lactic acid. <laughs> so all these things are milk associated things. Very commonly in yeah. yogurt. That's what makes yogurt have that little bit of sour or acidic taste to it. Which one do I like out of the alternative nut milks? Ooh, um, that's a good question. Depends on what I'm using it for. Um, flax, not flax. Uh, I hemp. have heard good things about hemp, hemp milk, milk recently. Yeah. I have yeah. heard really good things about oat <laughs> milk recently. I have yet to try either of those, mm. but oat milk I think is the one that's on my um, on my radar for the next thing I want to try. I have never tried oat milk. I didn't even know there was an oat I've, milk. I have heard that it is the most similar to regular milk, and it's awesome in coffee apparently. So oats in general, interestingly, they're a good source of fiber. Yes. I, think I wonder if the fiber is still... Well, I call them beta, beta glucans. I'm sure I'm getting this wrong, but they have a special kind of, of fiber that's in oats and also mm. in barley that promotes a good microbiome. Mm -hmm. So maybe, gotcha. that's, maybe, that's why the, maybe that's why the oat milk is good for you. Maybe, maybe. Um, but yeah, I, I typically go uh, between... I use soy butter. That's very good. Um, but then I have... Uh, I use almond milk for things that are more savory in nature, and then I typically use coconut milk for things that are more sweet in nature. So you didn't or mention... Or if I'm making, like, a curry or something. Yeah. Mm, that's making me hungry. I know, me too. So milk with a Y. Milk with I a like Y. It. It's interesting. Yeah, I like that. There's it a, makes it more clear, There's an almond you know? milk called milk. Ooh. Like I, I like milk with a Y better. M-E-L-K, actually. M-A-L-K. M-A-L-K. Oh, <laughs> milk. wow. Milk. Sorry. Milk. That's just how people say milk sometimes. Milk. <laughs> Not to, you know. Uh, no mammalian <laughs> estrogen in them. That's very true. That is very true. I wonder Nor how much any estrogen is. other kinds of estrogen. <laughs> in. I'm sure there's some. There's got to be some estrogen in milk, breast milk. In breast milk, yeah. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Dude, Drool. coconut curry, I know. I'm coconut, with you. Truly one of the best things so ever, good. right? Oh. Hey, while we're on the topic of coconut milk, can I just say something about that? Please do. Coconut milk. Awesome. I love coconut milk. <laughs> Coconuts may be the perfect food. It's really good. It has both a drink in it yep. and a great source of protein and fat. So one thing though, so back in the day, 
people used to get all up in arms and excited about saturated fat. Yep. And people are a little bit less so now. But that was during the like <clears throat> the like pro sugar movement. Almost well, kind of this, too. yeah. It was this low fat movement? Yeah. I think that the jury is still out at least a little bit on saturated fat. Okay. But the coconut milk example kind of is proves that you can't say that all saturated fat is bad. Right. Coconut milk contains a 14 and a 12 chain fatty acid. One of them is called is lauric acid. Um, at any rate, these are shorter chain fatty acids that seem to have all kinds of beneficial health health impacts on mm -hmm. you. So medium chain fats and short chain fatty acids um, are good. Lauric acid being the long, it's the I believe it's the it's the shortest fatty acid which is solid at room temperature. Mm -hmm. If you get any shorter than that, you're just pure, pure liquid. All right. Cool. Which is why coconut milk, if you buy it in the store, um, the, if you buy the uh, the fat, mm -hmm. what do you call it, coconut oil? The, yeah, right, coconut oil, yeah. If it's warm, like in the summertime, ours turns into liquid. Yep. And if it's cold, it turns into solid. Yeah, it's solid, right, totally. All right. Yeah, yeah. So interestingly, the coconut oils actually seem to have beneficial impacts on your gut microbiota. Mm. And they might do that in part by actually destabilizing and, and making life harder for certain harmful kinds of micro microbes in your, in your guts. Because that lauric acid, this in, this in coconut oil, it actually kills off pathogens. You can actually use it as an antimicrobial. Interesting. I did not know that. Yeah, so we talked a little, a little bit about alternative medicine last time. Mm -hmm. And I was listening to some skeptic podcast about the dentist who was going on and on about how stupid it is that people buy coconut oil, and they swish it around in their mouth, and they spit it out. And they're saying okay. this is not evidence-based, and I think it's called oil pulling or something like that. Hmm. And really, probably the rationale behind doing this that people give is incorrect. But there's a good biological basis for it okay. because the microbes in your mouth, many of them really are harmful, and you can preferentially kill some of the bad ones with coconut oil. Again, mm. please don't take anything I'm saying as sure. medical advice, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I'm just saying this is biologically plausible and supported by some sure. microbiological evidence. So maybe we should give that another look. But maybe. the bottom line is that coconut oil is okay for you. Um, is there any truth to the fact that, sa I think this is true, yeah, that saturated fat is a basic building block for human cells? That is true. Yeah, I, I have heard this as an argument that people mention when, um, when there is this backlash against eating saturated fat, that you need some level of saturated fat. And if breast milk is the perfect evolved food, and it probably right. is if you're a baby. Yes. Um, breast milk contains the fat part of it is, I want to say, 60 or 70% saturated fat. Oh, it's wow. actually pretty high. Now, having said that, if you look at places where babies are healthiest, they tend to have more unsaturated fat or more mm -hmm. long chain um, DHA and EPA. So these are mega 3 fatty acids. Right. Yes. They're super long right. chain, they're not saturated. And so there is some evidence that having more of those is good for you. And in places where people lack access to those fats and you have more saturated fat, the babies can actually possibly do worse. So there's a paper done here in the state of New Mexico oh, that went to the okay. Navajo Reservation and they found that certain Navajo women had a very, very low amount of the unsaturated fat and that correlated with some bad outcomes mm, in babies. Okay. Whereas Melanie Martin and Michael Gervin and colleagues have done work in Bolivia and looked at a similar Native American group or Native Amerindian group, and the Chimane have very high levels of omega-3 fatty acids. Right. And it's possible that does their babies good. They also have really healthy hearts. They do. I have heard. Very little heart disease yes. and almost no allergies. Yeah. All right. So saturated fat is not all bad. Yes. yes. <laughs> it's just not all bad. Um, okay. Mucin. So when we talk about mucin. we talk about feeding our mic microbes. So we talked about feeding them with fiber, and we talked about feeding them with breast milk oligosaccharides. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it, maybe you haven't thought about it. But <laughs> how do how does a hibernating animal maintain its microbiome? If you're a bear or even a squirrel, I I don't think I have ever thought about that question. That's you don't really spend time worrying about this. <laughs> no, I don't. It's like, come on, man, what happens? <laughs> So I stopped hibernating a long time ago. <laughs> I like to hibernate. <laughs> but if you're a bear, bears don't lose their microbiomes. They wake up in the spring and they have a microbiome. Why do they have a microbiome? How does the microbiome survive without food? Well, 
your intestines feed the microbiome, and they feed it with essentially mucus. So mucus is a carbohydrate, and there's little mi microbes that, that graze on your mucus. Wow. And so I look at this as being an example of a beneficial resource sharing. It's, it's good for us to maintain certain populations of beneficial microbes, and we do this by directly feeding them. And we feed them with certain sugars called mu mucins okay. in our guts. Hmm. Other people have looked at this as being maybe a bad thing, that when you have excessive grazing by microbes on your, on your mucus, that can actually be bad. That's also probably true. Yeah, I could see that being true. And they say that happens if you don't have enough fiber in your diet. So in other words, mm. hey, microbes just got to eat, and if you're not going to give it the fiber in the diet, right. it's going to chew on your own fiber, which is your mucus, and they're going to get a little bit too close to your, to your little enterocytes, and that's going to cause inflammation and make you sick and unhealthy. So there's some evidence for that too. But I think in general, in the healthy state, this feeding of microbes with mucus is actually a good thing. That's what I think. Cool. All right. Um... Silence from the chat. Vitamins. All right, so there's. We have. Certain... I have too much mucus. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I do too. That's kind of how time. I feel most most days these right now. So <laughs> I have very negative thoughts about mucus right. at the moment. <laughs> it's not all bad. All right, so th if that's an example of cooperation. We've talked about three different ways you can feed your microbes. There are things that we fight over. So this is getting back to the hyena example. Sorry. Uh, oh, yes. We fight, we seem to fight with microbes over iron. And this guy, Matthew Barber, mm. did a paper, it's old now, four years old, in, in science. science. It's a good paper. So he really showed that we've been locked into this arms race with certain kinds of microbes, really bad ones, over iron. That we try to keep the iron away from the microbes. The microbes try to steal the iron. This is a real thing, it's called iron piracy. And they have little molecules that take iron away from our, our proteins and steal it, so that's what this picture shows. And both these things have been under very, very wow. strong natural selection. You can see evidence of selection for the genes that control these things. The protein that helps you hold on to iron, which is mostly called transferrin, and then um, there's a, a similar protein that bacteria make which steal the iron away uh, from us. So that's what that's what's being shown there. So where is the iron in this? I think iron is that tiny little It's these little dot. dots? Yeah, it's okay. little dot. I'm amazed at, at how this is showing the, the two... The actual structure. Yeah, the structure, yeah. The, it, and it's fitting together It's kind of so like neatly. a lock and key. Yeah, yeah. All right, that didn't happen by accident. This happened by evolution. No, absolutely. I mean, that's this is why... Mm -hmm. This is the thing about allergies that has always interested me, because mm -hmm. the reason why you can have allergies to various things that are sort of related to each other is because you have an antibody that essentially yeah. locks in to the shape of a particular antigen, and if they're related and they have similarly shaped antigens in your bloodstream, it's going to lock onto it. Right. So it, if you have a slightly different key, it might still get into that lock. And, and it's thought problems. that we've evolved some of these little receptors for these antigens to recognize parasites. Right. Like worms. Yes. yes. Or helmets. Right. And what's crazy is in some places, I think birch pollen looks like schistosomiasis. Right. You know? So that's what's interesting, too, because it's, um, it's the same key for the yeah. same lock. Like environmental allergies or yeah. food allergies, theoretically, there is a difference in allergenicity of right. each thing. And some, so something is more or less likely to cause allergies. And that could be because of how they are related to some of these worms or other parasites that we have evolved to try and lock onto. So I, I remember crazy. reading that paper that birch pollen looked a lot like a little protein so made by crazy. the worm. That so is so It makes cool. you wonder, well, what happened first? Yeah, Did right. Did the worm evolve like a coating that looked like birch pollen so that it could escape the immune system? Anyway, these, yeah, are, these yeah. are the things that I think about. That's I'm, really interesting. You know, That's very cool. Sorry, not sorry. I'm going to hold on to that one for, <laughs> for Science Happy Hour on Friday. It's a good one. Yeah. I like that. Anyway, yes. pretty good example, an evolutionary story of fighting over Micronutrients. Yes. So should we eat iron fortified foods? What do you think? Um well I'm a I am a woman. I don't know if you guys noticed. Um and women typically need more iron than men do. This is what what's thought to be. Uh because of I, I think the 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 thinking around it is is because of menstruation. Um Well haven't women also evolved to menstruate? Yeah, right. So why would women have to take a supplement? 
or something which is natural? So, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, the assumption there is that maybe in your diet currently, even though we're evolved to menstruate, maybe we mm. are not currently eating the correct diet that gives us enough iron to, to facilitate that. I thought you were going to say that women in evolutionary past didn't menstruate as much as what they do now. Oh, I would say the opposite. Think we menstruate less? Yes. Fascinating. Well, I don't know. <laughs> um, I think some women menstruate mm -hmm. a lot less just because of birth control. Um, but I oh, can okay. see the argument that um, if you're having more babies, right. then you're, you're having fewer menstruation But there's also cycles. the bleeding which yeah. is associated with uh, childbirth. Anyway, right, so yeah, yeah, women lose iron we in blood. We lose a lot of iron, yes. Either right. by menstruation or by childbirth. Yep. And so perhaps women have a higher need for iron than men. I think it's a big maybe. Okay. Right? But if the story which I just told you, which is that iron feeds pathogens, is true, then supplementing... Right, it's not we'll exactly... We'll say children that aren't menstruating yeah, right. with iron okay. is going to be bad. And I think that's sure. what's on the next slide. Yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily think that... Like, I don't, I don't take iron supplements. Um, I know that there are birth control pills that already have an iron supplement in them um, for that very purpose. But, I mean, if you're, if you're prone to anemia, mm -hmm. then you probably should. Um, so this study was a very well-meaning study. They tried to give children in the Ivory Coast bread that either had or did not have iron supplementation. And what they showed was that the kids who got the iron actually had more stomach complaints and didn't seem to do any better mm. than the kids who didn't get the iron. Yeah, doesn't iron actually cause stomach upset? Well, it does, and it causes constipation. Oh, okay. Yeah. There you go. And in this a... study... Hello. Oh, sorry, guys. It's okay. <laughs> Greetings. In this study, they showed that the iron really messed up these kids' microbiomes. Wow. It caused an overgrowth of some really pathogenic species. Exactly what you predict it. from the previous slide. Yep. But if, the, feeding, if, the, feeding. if we're fighting over iron with certain kinds of bad microbes, then if you give them excess, you might get excessive bad microbes. So this is, seems to be true in places where children are malnourished and where there's lots of infectious disease. Okay. It's possible that people here in the United States can get away with taking iron supplements because we don't have so much, so many mm. pathogens in our guts. Again, that's okay. a big maybe. Yeah, that makes sense, maybe. But the lesson I think to learn here is that we should be cautious. We shouldn't sure. just think, oh, your iron is low, I'm gonna give you iron. And then that's gonna make you better. Because we've ignored this, again, the elephant in the room, which is the microbiome. And if they're busy fighting with you for iron, that's an interesting story. Hmm. What about in cases of, of, of true anemia? Well, these are, these, I think these children were anemic. Oh, okay. Or they were like so borderline probably, anemic. probably, right. So yeah, I just so wonder if it's, um, it's probably some sort of interaction effect where yeah. giving the iron when needed, mm -hmm. but in a particular environment where you are either more or less prone to having adverse reactions, maybe. Maybe so that's pathogens, maybe that's problems with the diet, I don't know. So Tom McDade mm -hmm. of Northwestern yes. University, he's an anthropologist. He wrote a nice article arguing, in effect, that iron deficiency anemia might be adaptive. And it might be adaptive because it protects you mm. from certain kinds of infections that have iron as part of their strategy for making you sick. All right? So if that's the case, then we shouldn't, again, even people that are, appear to be deficient, we shouldn't just be out there trying to give everybody iron. And we see, we see people kind of react badly to iron. Uh, we sometimes give people an iron infusion in the in their veins, and it's not uncommon that people have a, a like a inflammatory reaction. To yeah, that iron. sounds weird. Yeah. So as a general rule, your body has this way of coping with sickness. And that's either infection or could be cancer by making you anemic, and maybe that anemia is in fact adaptive in certain some, mm. some cases. Mm. And if it's adaptive, an evolved trait that helps keep iron away from pred pred micro predators in your weakened state, right. then, then, then maybe we shouldn't be, be trying to give everybody iron. Mm. I think that's true. So I, that's my, my belief <laughs> is that we overprescribe iron, that we overdiagnose anemia. We never think about the possibility that anemia might be a good thing. 
Interesting. All right. I there's, have there's not heard anything about this with the a new crazy music. counterpoint to this. Okay. So I went to this conference in Canada, and I heard a talk by a woman by the name of Janelle Ayers, and she's awesome. And I've invited her to my evolutionary oh, yes. medicine conference yes, this yes, summer, yes, yes. and I'm looking forward to hearing her talk. She has a very different take on iron. Okay. If the science paper by um, Matthew Barber is kind of the traditional way that evolution, evolutionary-minded people think about iron, she kind of has the opposite. So she thinks that under certain circumstances, giving iron can actually prevent microbes from killing you. <laughs> She's shown this in mice, not in people. Sure. It's really trippy and really cool. It just shows you that, like I said, you have to pay attention to the microbiome. Some cases, iron might kill you. In some cases, iron might protect you. But you, you have to look at it in terms of this crazy, possibly three-way interaction that happens. There's wow. never a simple answer to this question. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, this goes to Paranor's point about personalized healthcare being yep. the way to go. This, this would it. totally feed into that Great for point. sure. Yeah. But in general, I am anti-vitamin. I think you should get your micronutrients from food. And most people that study nutritional epidemiology, I think, would agree with me. And actually, the story behind like Wonder Bread, mm -hmm. I don't even know if you can buy Wonder Bread anymore. I think it's still yeah. out there. So white bread, it says fortified with nine essential nutrients and min minerals. Yep. They basically, the food industry with this hugely processed food, took all the fiber and essentially everything good out of bread. Yep. And they sold you a bill of goods by saying, hey, we're giving you the good stuff back in, in, the, in the nutrients. It didn't work for Wonder Bread. It didn't work in, for this Ivory Coast example. And in general, it doesn't work for you. You probably shouldn't be taking vitamins as a way of making you healthy. All it does is make you poorer because vitamins are expensive. And there's some instances, like with selenium and vitamin E, and I believe vitamin A, so antioxidant vitamins taken to prevent heart disease and cancer had this paradoxical effect shown in a large, enormous randomized controlled trial of actually increasing the risk of cancer. Oh, wow. So there's good evidence for a lot of vitamins that taking them is bad for you. So I think that you need to get your vitamins from food. That's the bottom line. That's the safe thing to do. Very straightforward. Um, there may be a few exceptions. The jury, I think, is out on prenatal vitamins. Mm. But an over-reliance on iron and antioxidant supplements in general is probably a bad thing. Um, what do you think about... Uh, how people don't take into account bioavailability. Um, so someone brought up yeah. counting macros, and they're not necessarily taking into account that all of that not all of some protein or whatever is being actually taken up mm -hmm. um, in the body. I think that there's something that? to that argument. I think that people have the bioavailability argument is something that people have used to explain why it is that supplements don't seem to work. Yeah, yeah. And I think that right. if we just kind of fall back on the other take-home point, that mm -hmm. if you eat nutritious foods that tend to have some of these things embedded in them, that our body has evolved to deal with that. And our body has not evolved to deal with a massive overdose of a vitamin and a pill. So it's not just the bioavailability. It's not just what does your body need. Right. It is how does the thing, the nutrient, affect cooperation and conflict in your microbiome. Iron can promote conflict. We've seen that. And in fact, iron causes constipation, probably because of its effects on the microbiota. And this happens in elderly people. So my wife's grandmother, who recently passed away, um, she was noted to have anemia. Okay. Her doctor put her on iron. She got very constipated. She was straining on the toilet. She had a lower GI bleed. She oh, wow. passed out had a syncopal episode, ultimately broke her hip, and then sometime later um, died from this. So, <laughs> cautionary tale. Oh right? my gosh. And just, we don't think of like hey, the constipation of iron just being a bad thing, these. but it really can be. It can be, that, it can, I mean, it can be lethal. You could directly trace that to the iron. Or yeah. Really to the anemia. I, well, no, to the iron. Yeah, to the iron. Yeah. Oh my God, that's brutal. So, and she actually complained about it. I was like, yeah, they, they really shouldn't have given me that iron. Yeah, that's awful. Oh, my gosh. Sorry. Yeah. It's a bit of a downer. Yeah. Well, I mean, cautionary she was, tale, She was beloved. Yeah. She uh, lives in 97. Oh, man. She had a great life. Oh, I'm sorry. That's a bummer.
Man, but 97. That's, 97. That's solid. Can't get too much better than that. Yeah, seriously. Um, <clears throat> all right, let's, shall we continue? Mm -hmm. Ooh. Well, we talked about how we tolerate charts. tons of microbes in the colon. That's where the pH tends to be lower. I'm mm. oh, sorry. <laughs> pH tends to be actually a little bit higher or neutral oh, yeah. in the colon. Where the pH is lowest is in your stomach and your small intestine. Mm -hmm. so again, this is, the story is a bit complicated, but we use acid and pH to control bacterial populations. Where we don't want them, we make a ton of acid. So we make that in your, in your stomach. And that does two things. It prevents potentially bad pathogens in food yep. from making their way into your microbiome and then making you sick. That's good. And it also allows you to kind of control the numbers of microbes in your proximal gut. If you're killing everything, then you, you have control over it. So this proves the point to me that and the microbes are not just going to do right for you. You have to have these inputs, and acid is one of them. So the story here is that we tolerate these huge numbers of fermenting microbes in the colon, so that's this mutualistic or beneficial relationship, but we don't tolerate the same number in your stomach or small intestine. So then you have to think about well, what happens if you take acid. All right, acid reducing medicines. Oh, like a, right. Like oh. Protonics. Yeah. Um, some of these medicines. Prilosec. The Prilosec. Yep. They're over the counter. Yep. So they're over the counter because we think the acid is useless and all it does is cause right. us harm. But in fact, the acid is critical to controlling your microbiome. Mm. So if you just Google uh, proton pump inhibitor and side effect, they have all kinds of crazy side effects. I have heard <laughs> that being on something like Prilosec or whatever yeah. for long periods of time can cause leaky gut. Well, it certainly causes leaky gut. It also causes increased fractures. It causes increased all-cause mortality. You're more likely to die. Whoa. Um, there's some evidence that may actually increase your risk of a heart attack. Crazy. Might increase your risk of dementia. So these are bad drugs. And do you think... So when I, when I see people in the ER and they're on these medicines, I say, it's fine to take them short term. Yeah. These are not meant to be taken long term. Right, right. Do you think that the reason why there are all of these crazy side effects is because of its effect on the microbiome? Yes, ma'am. I suspect it <laughs> as much. I think so. I'm not the only crazy person that thinks yeah. this. But I do think that's true. That one of the reasons for why taking proton pump inhibitors is bad mm -hmm. for us is because it has these negative impacts. And if we think about medicine as being kind of like food, that it can mm. modulate conflict and cooperation in the microbiome, then an acid reducer really is a conflict medicine. It causes right. conflict in your microbiome. Sure. And so, maybe sometimes on the short term that might be helpful to you, but you still have to be cognizant of the fact that that's yeah. what, what it's doing. Um, would drinking something like soda that does have an acidic mm. effect to it have any bearing on this? Do we well, that's know a good this? question. I mean, it's also full of sugar, so yeah. I imagine that that's... Um, yeah, so my wife likes to I use uh, Diet Coke or, or Dr. Pepper to descale things and to you know, as a cleaner yeah, yeah. to get rid of like hard water deposits oh. <laughs> and she she pours the stuff out she's that like how can anybody drink good. this stuff oh god right, right? Um, so yeah so there are certain soft drinks that actually have a fairly, fairly low pH it's not as low as what's in your stomach so I think the short answer to your question is that eating acidic foods might be good um, but probably isn't good when it comes to sugary soft drinks because of the high, high amount of sugar mm. Uh, so apparently there's been a recent study in The Lancet um, showing that lead poisoning may be a lot more common than we have expected. Have you heard anything about this? No. We've got the paper, Lead and the Heart, an Ancient Metal's Contribution to Modern Disease. Interesting. Lead is bad. Lead is bad, <laughs> for sure. I mean, so I think we're lucky. Most places in Albuquerque here have relatively low amounts of yeah. lead in the water. Thank goodness. Yep. Unlike, say, Flint, Michigan. Cause of hypertension, risk factor for heart disease, stroke, chronic kidney disease. Yeah. I'm going to have to take a look at this. I don't, so I'll say, I haven't yeah, heard I don't about know this about yet. this either. It's very interesting. I mean, lead is, heavy metals are, are poisons. Yeah, yeah. And they impact your whole body's functioning, including your brain. Oh, so yeah. This is a fascinating, yeah. thank you for bringing that to our attention. Lead makes the mind give way, quoted oh, yeah. in the first... Ooh, wow. Yep. 
from Greek physician Discorides. Discorides. Yep. Huh. Nice. I wasn't aware of Discorides cool. until now. Yeah. So that was that I was like that, that was helpful in a lot of ways. Yeah. Hey, Maven. Yes, this this is a University of New Mexico hoodie or yeah anti hoodie. Less there is no hoodie, but yes, yeah. jacket of some kind. <laughs> Close. But yes. Um, uh, yeah, that's really cool. So it makes a compelling case that lead poisoning is the biggest contributor to heart disease. Well, that's mm. fascinating. I'm going to have to read the article. In the absence of other things? Like, like smoking? Separate or diet or lack of ex exercise? How about this? It's a previously under-recognized cause of heart disease. Yes. I would right. say that. I would agree with that. <laughs> but biggest contributor? I'd have a hard time putting my stamp on that one, but maybe, yeah. but maybe, maybe. Who knows? we'll have to read the paper. Um, let's see. Cool. Oh, wow. It's been in the documentary too. Huh? Wow. Well, you know, sometimes <laughs> when I say that everything has to do with the microbiome, I mean, clearly things like lead or tobacco yeah. smoke right. prove the point that not everything is about the microbiome. It's true. It's very true. Sometimes we just do bad shit yeah. to our bodies. <laughs> Like this. Look at that segue. Right. I didn't even know that was there. That was perfect. So, chat. How many of you guys have been to New Mexico? This is a oh, Blake's lot of burger. Lot of burger. It's a lot of burger. This is a. I think it's a purely New Mexican thing. It is. Although I read recently, the company is from Texas. Originally. They're from Texas, but I think yeah. it's just in New Mexico. Yeah, it is. And they're trying to branch out to some other places. Oh, okay. So this is our local kind of burger joint. Yep. It is amazingly good. It's pretty good. <laughs> Probably amazingly bad for you. Oh, yeah, they're terrible. I mean, honestly, I would rather eat this than, like, drink a gallon of soda. So it is making me hungry. This is a double meat, double cheese with green chili. Yep. Blake's a lot of burger. I can't do awesome. doubles, man. I'm just not, you can't? not capable. All right. I haven't done this in a long time. Because I, I actually have a little bit of willpower. Yeah. <laughs> I also go no cheese, too. So. Right. So my burgers are typically... At least a little bit healthier. Mm, green chili. It does look <laughs> delicious. With green chili, yeah, for sure. So let's, let's break down this green hamburger. Green chili, also antimicrobial. That's true. So if you eat enough green chili, you can actually counteract some of the bad impacts of, yeah. of a bad diet. Right. This is really, really true. Yes. And it's something that we should think about. So we haven't really got into that, but you can actually counteract some bad features of food if you add yep. something like uh, spices or Spicy. capsaicin. It's really just capsaicin, right? Yeah, So, but they've, there's a paper that shows that if you eat a junk food diet, and they do this in rats, that they have this spike in sugar, and they also have a spike in, they start to gain weight. But if you give them green chili at the same time, it blocks it. Pretty amazing. So maybe this is the, uh, the rationale wow. that you add green chili to everything. I think that's exactly what right. it's saying. Green chili, good. Yes. <laughs> you can get it right here in New Mexico. But other parts, the white bread, we'll start with the bun. Yep. That is going to be broken down to simple carbohydrate. Yep. And that's going to tend to feed and uh, promote conflict. So anytime that this is, so think about that wildebeest and the hyenas example. Anytime there's a package of energy which is easily accessible to both parties, it's going to cause some degree of conflict. So this is why eating simple sugar is bad for you. It's why eating fiber that actually preferentially feeds only a certain kind of microbe and ones that our bodies carefully cultivate tends to be better for us. All right. I'm getting really hungry. I don't know I about know. you. <laughs> I'm getting there too. Processed cheese. This is not just regular old cheddar. So this is this is cheese in which they've added emulsifiers. So emulsifiers tend to break down the, the uh, mucus barrier mm -hmm. and actually cause and cause um, microbes to one get too close to you. Okay. You want to you know don't stand too close to me. You want a little bit of space between you and your microbes. We this is that leaky gut, with, right? Yeah, we accomplish that with mucus. So the little, and also there, there can be beneficial microbes that can provide a bit, a bit of a barrier uh, effect or promote barrier function in your gut. So if you eliminate those microbes and you get rid of the, the mucus barrier, and we do this with emulsifiers that are in lots and lots of processed foods, mm -hmm. including some of that cheese, that's going to actually cause a breakdown of your gut barrier oh, wow. and, and cause problems. Yeah. Is this from yeah. that same paper? Yeah. Yeah, I could tell. The, the graphics the are graphics. the same, yeah. They're nice. Kind of fun little pictures. Yeah, yeah. It's not perfect. You know, one thing that's, that's cool about this, you see that little tail? We show the little, little harmful microbes with tails. Mm -hmm. They have flagella. Yep. All right? So this is something, this is kind of getting into the upper level stuff. But if you have microbes in your gut, 
you kind of want them just to stay put. You want them to, and also when it comes time for you to want to get rid of them, like with a good bowel movement, you don't want them to fight fight back. Right, okay? right, for sure. So you want a relatively immobile microbe yep. that's going to do what you want and stay where you want it. You don't want microbes that can, you know, have their driver's license and can drive <laughs> around wherever they want. So microbes have flagella. Actually, it's a virulence factor. And so a lot of bad E. coli that can cause disease, they, mm. as part of their virulence program that causes illness, they grow a little flagella. So we could do a little sample on you, dear chat. Yes. And we could find out how many of your microbes have flagella or little tails. How mobile are they? So the more mobile they are, probably the worse off you are. This is not something I've actually seen that people offer as a test, but I think that's something that people should do. Yeah. If there was a way we could we could look for flagella expression, wow, just in, in a, a poop sample, and we'd have an idea about how healthy you are. That's interesting. Am I crazy? Yeah, I mean, or not so crazy, yeah. I suppose. Um, Wait, don't take I'm, away my cheese. No, well, no, no. just just right. the I was talking about processed cheese. Processed cheese, like American slices. All right. Pro tip number three yeah. or four. There you go. Buy real cheese. Yes. Buy the, buy the real good cheese. stuff. Buy the aged cheese that's actually been fermented even longer. Oh tends yeah, to have, extra sharp white cheddar you're doing. Tends to have even thing. better, like a, a group of fatty acids has microbial metabolites in it. So your body kind of detects when food has been processed <laughs> by beneficial bacteria yep. and fermented, because these are not pathogens by and large. And so that's why eating aged cheese is so good for you. So good. I love it. I wish I could all right, eat We're cheese. all getting hungry now. This is bad. I know, dude. I'm like <laughs> fiending. Okay, well, this is this is the last, as far as slides go, this is the last slide. Mm -hmm. All right, so my research collaborator, Carlo Maley, who wrote a paper with me, he came up with this little, this little picture. It basically says that when our interests are in alignment with microbes, when there is things like resource sharing, we're eating a high fiber diet, we're not taking um, acid reducing medications, we're, um, you know, being breastfed, for instance, right. that, that tends to promote cooperation in our guts. And when that happens, we end up being healthy. If we eat the wrong foods and we eat things with emulsifiers and iron, excess simple sugars, lots of processed foods, we tend to cultivate conflict in our guts. And that tends to cause disease. So this is just a way, you know, this is a model. And I forget who said that all models are, are incorrect. It's just a matter of like, this is an oversimplification of a right, complex system. Yeah, yeah, of course. Right? But I think that this scheme actually allows you to kind of put everything in context when it comes to food. We want to promote cooperation. And we can do that with, with our dietary choices. We can't choose whether we were breastfed as infants. That's true. Unfortunately. I was yep. not. I was not. That's why I'm a bundle of allergies. Yep. But so this is, this is a, a, how I, the way I look at it. And it really takes into consideration the idea that microbes can be both good and bad for you. This, I mean, this puts it really into perspective that you've got a spectrum of where your microbiome right. is going to be in terms of the cooperation conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, but then generally, we are always going to be healthier if we're farther on the cooperation side. So one thing <laughs> I didn't put on the cooperation side is fermented foods. And oh, I really, okay. really should have done that. Yeah, yeah. So Just any, any probiotic... In in probiotics. General. Yeah. And it's it's amazing to me, and I don't think it's gotten quite enough attention, why it is that probiotics oftentimes have these predictably good impacts mm -hmm. on our body. And I think it's because we've evolved with this complex kind of community, both yeah. the good and the bad. So when your body basically gets a big input of what is generally good, and we can talk about why they're good, then the, your body kind of relaxes. I mean, yeah. your immune system dials things back, your uh, nervous system isn't quite on so much alert. <laughs> so we, our, your nervous system pays attention to your, to your microbes as much as to everything else in your environment. And so that's why probiotics can impact things like anxiety and depression. Yeah. Truly crazy stuff, but amazingly true. <laughs> um, hang on one second. Yeah. Probiotics. Probiotics. Do we think, so yogurt has naturally occurring cultures in it. People say you could just eat yogurt to get some probiotic effect. Mm -hmm. Do we think that getting probiotic from our diet is enough? Or do you think that we need to be going 
towards the, the supplement route for, for probiotics. So I was invited to give a talk to the International Probiotics Association. And full disclosure, I still, kind of, I still serve as a scientific advisor. For their, it's an unpaid position for the, for the IPA, the International Probiotics Association. You mean not India Pale Ale? Not India Pale Ale. <laughs> but so, like I said, they, did, they paid for me to go to a conference several years ago, but they haven't recently. Um, so full disclosure. And they asked me, though, do you take probiotics? And I was like, no. And I really gave them the same line as I give on supplements. You shouldn't take these things in pills when you can get them from food. And I think that's basically true. This is what I do. So I drink kombucha. I, I eat yogurt. I get my probiotics that way. Mm -hmm. Having said that, there's good evidence that you can prevent things like diarrhea when you're traveling from taking probiotics. Yep. And it might just be inconvenient or impossible to get a hold of yogurt. So if you can get it in a pill, that might be an sure. example of where it may be beneficial. Right. But I do, I do want to kind of stick with the general principle of get your micronutrients, the beneficial microbes, and your prebiotics, the foods that feed good microbes, that's your fiber, yep. from food. So I think that's, that's where kind of the money's on that. Yep. Yeah. Yes, that's a very... Well, so this is a good question. Drop Bear mm -hmm. just asked, do you need to eat a lot of yogurt to get a real measurable effect? Well, I think that when you look at, say, the... It depends on the yogurt because certain kinds... What they've shown is that for any kind of outcome that we care about, if it's, say, a decrease in... Um, you know, pain in your gut or mm -hmm. whatever it is, that the strain matters. So you may have a yogurt that actually has a strain which isn't so good for you. But in general, most of the species that people kind of settled upon are good for you. If it says it contains a lot live cultures, it's probably good. Right. There are certain kinds of yogurts. So it will depend, I guess. It depends on the, on the yogurt for sure. Yeah, a lot of yogurts actually are hidden sugar factories as That's well. True. They have like an unbelievable amount of added sugar. Mm -hmm. So I, I actually used to get dairy-free yogurt that was, right. you know, in the, the individual cups. And there's like 13 grams of sugar in each one of those or something. It's ridiculous. So I think this is one of these examples where the probiotics might actually counteract the it's fact possible, that sugar. yeah, and there's some fiber in there too. Yeah, so um, you want to avoid the added sugar. Yeah, the added sugar. But right. milk has lactose in it. Right. It's yeah. Sugar. So it's it is added sugar, right? It's it's not. Or it's in it. Yeah. So like, and there's fruit probably in there, and that's fine. Uh, but I've switched to the the bigger like the unsweetened plain or vanilla, mm. and I just add fruit to it, and it's like maybe a gram of sugar, I think. And what I, so what I do is something gram, similar. I so remember. I've started to make my own yogurt, which you can do very cheaply. And it only takes a few hours to do it. It's pretty amazing. Or you, mm -hmm. you basically you take your milk, you heat it up, you cool it down, you put in your, your yogurt yeah. starter, you, you stir it up overnight, and then you wake up in the morning and you have yogurt. And that's a simple example of it. And then I'll, I, will, I don't add any extra sugar to it. Right. Um, I, I will put in fruit. And you, it's, it's good. Yeah. It's delicious. It's I, I usually do a little granola too, add yeah. some protein. So I think this um, is solid dietary advice. Yeah. Again, I'm not trying to give medical advice. Right, I know, here. yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah. what about kefir and kombucha and all that? I I'm a fan. I particularly so I like water kefir. I've never Obviously, I've never I had water do the kefir. Milk kefir. I've, had, um, I've had I make tea kombucha. Ooh. That, oh, you did say that last week and yeah. I think I made the exact same reaction. Probably. <laughs> Sounds delicious. It is good. Um, yeah, so I think yeah, that that's it's all easier to understand why it is that yogurt is good for you. Because yogurt is basically, it's got this lactobacilli mostly. And lactobacilli are microbes that have, we have evolved along with breast milk. As mammals, mammalian organisms, mm -hmm. <laughs> women for, for humans yeah. or females for other, other, other species, they have lactobacilli associated with the breast milk. And this is, this is the organism which, which tends to promote the health. So right. it's been a nice example of coevolution involving yeah. diet. Yeah, yeah. So we've harnessed that or hacked that in, in traditional food production methods. And we've done this with yogurt and with a lot of fermented foods. So there's lactic acid, I think, in water kefir. And there's lactic acid bacteria in kombucha. Kombucha is a little weird, though. It has some, has some other species in it. Yeah, and yeah. It's not 100% clear why definitely. it's good for you. I'm actually involved with Athena Actipus' lab at Arizona State, and we're studying the microbiome of kombucha and really trying to figure out what it is that's good about it. But it does seem to be this crazy mutualism 
between a yeast and a bacterium、mm. that, as a useful byproduct for us, makes a very tasty tea. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah,、hmm. good stuff. I bet that is that still in progress? Research? The research? Yeah. We have a paper, a preprint that's available、uh, that looks at again, cooperation and conflict in, in kombucha. There you go. And、that how, sounds like a, a press release kind of paper. Yeah, I bet it's kind of cool. People would love that shit. So I don't think、really、it's actually、good. been published in a peer reviewed journal yet. Okay, so not so yet. So we'll,、gotcha. we'll keep you posted. Very cool.、Mm -hmm. um, so、uh, one of our, our lovely chat members,、mm -hmm. Uncle Bill, has mentioned that one of many jobs in my history, septic work,、Ooh. has given him the knowledge that families that love yogurt have healthier tanks. That's awesome. <laughs> that is so hilarious. I love that. <laughs> that is so funny. Wow, I love oh, it. Oh, <laughs> man. Yes, big old SCOBY, that's right. <laughs>、oh, yeah,、man. yeah, yeah.、Um, yeah, that's so funny. Oh, my gosh. I'm not surprised, though. I'm not either. You know, microbes.、Yeah. This, is, this is powerful stuff. I am, I'm like slightly interested, but also not really interested、uh, in、mm -hmm. knowing what it means to have a healthier tank. <laughs> Maybe one that doesn't kill you immediately. <laughs>、uh, <laughs> you're trying to clean it? Yeah, right. Hydrogen、um, sulfide? Yeah, like all kinds of badness. I, I, I could ask, but I'm not really sure I、right. want to know, to be honest. <laughs>、um, but yeah, yes, similar to sourdough. Yes, another wonderful fermented food,、mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, I feel like we got to do fermented foods like, soon. We do. We'll have to do a deep dive into、we、fermented、should. foods. We、it. absolutely should.、Yeah. Yes. Um, well, I don't know about you, but I could、mm -hmm. use a, a bathroom break.、Um, right. And we're just about, I think, we're wrapping up. So.、Yeah. Um, so, there's lots to say about diet. I wouldn't、yeah. mind at all revisiting this topic.、Um, I have more ideas about, about diet that we haven't gotten into.、Mm. Okay. So, yeah, we, have, we didn't talk about the ketogenic diet. So, there's lots,、oh, of, yes. lots of things that we can talk yeah, about. Yeah,、mm、yeah. -hmm. We can、That's、talk more about why spices are good for you. Yep.、Mm. We talked about that on our diet episode of Science Happy Hour. Right. Yep. Well, cool. So, yeah. Well, thank、cool. you, Kate. We'll, for we'll have another discussion. Yes, of course. Welcome. Thank you for being here.、Um, thank you, chat members. Ah, a septic、patient. tank lives on a biome, also. Ooh. That's very true. It、Big、has its、biofilm. own. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, M. Rathiel, thank you for that follow. I just saw it.、Um, sounds like a good prop for a future show. There you go.、Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some、uh, starter going on with Mike's eye here.、So. Oh, nice. Yes, 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 yes. Um, yeah, we have to have a, a fermented foods show soon. I'll, I'll get it on the schedule, like ASAP. Okay. Let's do it. So, all right, cool. Well, thanks,、so、that, guys. About wraps it up. Thank yeah, you.、Thanks、thank you guys for hanging out,、um, joining us. Yeah, we'll be back next Tuesday,、uh, a little bit later. So, we'll actually be starting at this time、um, instead of ending、um, so that Coffee Brown, Dr. Coffee Brown, can join us.、Um, so,、yep. we had a great time chatting with him last week.、Uh, yeah. And we'll be chatting about ADHD. Uh, autism. Autism, the, the spectrum, probably in Am general. Amphetamine.、Uh, the, the various treatments for some of these things.、Something, we're going to talk about cognitive bias in science. Yes.、Yep. That was a topic that Coffee brought up as a possibility.、Mm. And it kind of all fits. Yes. Yeah.、So、we're totally, talking about、right. cognition in the brain and、mm -hmm. you know,、yeah. neurotypical versus autistic、and、versus ADHD. Autism is a topic that has garnered a lot of cognitive bias. That's true. So that's、mm -hmm. very true. Um, so, something to look forward to. Regular Friday times are still a thing. This week we are going to be a little bit. Oh, for this show? No, we're doing Tuesdays now.、Um, but, uh, but for Science Happy Hour this week, we are going to be an hour later、uh, to allow、uh, one of our guests to make it in time.、Um, so, we'll be starting at 7 p.m. Mountain, mountain Time, 9 p.m. Eastern.、Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, cool. Yeah. Oh, heavy detergents or even antibiotics will kill the septic system. Man, I'm learning so much about septic systems right now. Yeah.、Easy. Also, yeast is good. How funny. Yeah. Well, that's something I know almost nothing about. I know, but I'm glad I know some more now. <laughs> This is cool. Interesting.、Um, yes. Oh, and the game. We're playing a game on Saturday.、Uh, check out the Brain Bite stuff because we're going to play. What is the game called again, Mike Sai?、Um, I cannot remember. Uh, we have to figure out the exact time for that, I think. I think we were going to start a little earlier.、Um, maybe? I'm not sure. But, but yes, we are going to be playing a, a community game with a bunch of the Brain Bites people. Cool. Temporal Invasion. It does look very, very fun. It's going to be lots of Googling and 
and investigating. It should be a good time. So, ah, okay, 4 p.m. Pacific. That's late. That is late. I don't think I'm going to make that one, actually. Um, that's very sad. Uh, I have a, a, a birthday gathering to go to, which was supposed to be last week, but now it's this week. <laughs> anyway, that's beside the point. Um, thank you guys so much for hanging out. Um, we will see you next Tuesday for our chat with an additional guest, and uh, I'll see you later on this week, maybe tomorrow morning or on Friday for some other streams. So, all right. All right. Over and out. See you guys. Bye-bye.